Citizens United. Uh huh. It's this day of mourning, as it's being called. But I think we're going to hear something positive tonight. I'm real excited about that. After the blurb we sent out, <laughs> we're, we're counting on you. We're counting on you. Anyway, I'm Cara Robin. I am president of the West LA Democratic Club. And uh, this is our first um, gathering together of our club and in concert with three other Democratic clubs. Uh, we have the Culver City Democratic Club with Sylvia Moore, president. The, the Santa Monica Democratic Club, Jay Johnson, president. And the Westchester Playa Democratic Club with Robert Schertz, president in the back. So uh, we hope to do many, many more of these uh, <laughs> in the coming year where we all get together and in harmony, Democrats in harmony, and get things done. Um, I'm sure you all heard the State of the Union yesterday, and what can he do? You know, we're trying, okay? We're trying. And uh, as Lance, where is Lance? Lance said at least there was uh, an environmental push. At least he got the environmental community to think about getting together, right? Okay, well, I don't want to take much time because we are kind of late. I would like to introduce Jay Johnson, who is going to introduce our uh, star speaker tonight, Mr. Tom Hayden. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. National treasure, that's the word I use when I think of Tom Hayden. He truly is one of our national treasures. To those of you and many in this audience who follow Tom, really most of all of our lives, because Tom himself has dedicated his life to, really to the progressive causes that we all stand for. Starting with the SDS movement back in the, I was going to say late 50s, but in the 60s, leading up to the uh, Democratic Convention in 68 in Chicago that you well know. I know. <laughs> I know. It's a Freudian slip. So I know it was in the 60s. So we're t talking about the uh, uh, Democratic Convention in Chicago that many of you recall to the Coalition for Economic Survival and the work against the Vietnam War that the CES had to put together. Tom, as you might have known, uh, was a candidate for United States Senator, getting 40% of the vote in the state of California. He was elected to the Assembly and served in the Assembly, I think, for 8 or 12 years and had many, many pieces of legislation passed by the House and the Senate in Sacramento. He ran for the City Council of Los Angeles and was narrowly defeated in the City Council race when they mysteriously could not find the votes for his home precinct, so figure, which would have been the deciding factor. He's committed himself to issue after issue, whether it's a question of uh, nationalist interests in, in uh, Ireland, whether it's the, the latest issues regarding what's been going on in Cuba. Tom has been involved in all of these things to this day, and tonight he's going to share his views on the climate and other key factors. Please welcome our national treasure, Tom Hayden. Thanks, Jay. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to be late. I thought it was across the street from our office. Um, and then I thought, it was, I didn't know where it was. And I kept seeing people walking toward me who looked at me strangely. And I said, where are you going? And they said, where are you going? So here we are. Um, I... Um, uh, have a, s a second apology to make. I don't know if this <clears throat> PowerPoint uh, presentation that I uh, planned can be uh, implemented. Of course, I know it by heart, but uh, it would be better to have the PowerPoint. Is it a yes or no there, gang? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> this... Uh, this introduction by my old friend Jay does make it sound a little like I hop from issue to issue, don't we all? Um, but there is kind of a through line uh, that brings us to the orbit of the Democratic Party, and that is the long uh, quest for <coughs> social equality and justice, uh, and for a government that is representative of the public interest more than the private interest, whether it's health care <coughs> or education or access to opportunity. Uh, those are the issues. Um, and it's not been um, the um, history of either party 
including the Democrats, to put the environment at the uh, forefront. Um, it could be because the uh, uh, environmental issue itself remained somewhat marginal in the land of the um, transcendentalists in the 19th century, some of the Native Americans, uh, because of the nature of our conquest and expansion of the uh, continent, it didn't appear that natural resources would be an issue. Uh, uh, but over the past 100 years, uh, in s starts and stops, there has grown an environmental movement that became so uh, important, as a matter of fact, that we lost uh, tragically the opportunity for Al Gore to be the first environmental president. Uh, w it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we can look back uh, uh, and dream of things that we'll never know, but he did write a very good book, especially for its time. He was very committed, morally as well as politically. He had a blueprint for action, and he had an election stolen from him. And uh, most Democrats were united in uh, fury at the, um, the loss of the election to the uh, Republican-appointed Supreme Court. But I don't remember uh, uh, very many people saying we just lost a chance to take the necessary steps to save the environment. Uh, it was more, um, our vote is meaningless, our vote should count, we are disenfranchised. Uh, but when you look back, um, from the time it took to get to Earth Day in the, at the end of the 60s, to the uh, possibility of a Gore environmental presidency only a decade later, and that it's now uh, 2015, you can see that time lost is not exactly recoverable. Time lost is really lost. Conditions have worsened, uh, and we're just now uh, in the process of a recovery uh, uh, of our environmental bearings. And a lot of people say it's too late. My view on that is that it is too late. We are going to suffer. Species are going to suffer. Life support systems are going to collapse. But to take that pessimism uh, to a uh, decisive conclusion would be a big mistake, tantamount to deciding on suicide uh, or participating in your own death willingly. Uh, and that's something that Democrats sometimes do. Uh, I, I, I myself don't share that view. Um, but it's true that we are no longer can celebrate Earth Day without remembering that we're entering Earth Night. We are entering the Dark Ages. But during that time, which can be very short or very long, beyond, beyond their lifetimes, uh, everybody will have to get up every day and care for their children uh, and uh, go about their business, even if the gloom is much greater. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't say that I'm optimistic or pessimistic, never have been, but uh, uh, this, is, this is a fight worth fighting. This is a, an education in consciousness worth experiencing. Uh, time is not um, the only factor here. It's how we choose to live our lives without knowing how long we have or the planetary system has. And there can be a danger in gradualism uh, on the one hand, and there can be a great danger in extreme pessimism and uh, apocalyptic thinking. So with that as a pretext, uh, sit back. Um, I want to thank uh, Emma Taylor back there and Susie Shannon for helping organize this event. Uh, could you please bring out the popcorn, dim the lights, everybody can sit back, take out your notepads, somebody can circulate a notepad and try to get everybody's email address for the questions and answers. This is not going to be a simple presentation, uh, but my purpose here is to um, 
begin talking to Democratic clubs, the rank and file of the Democratic Party, uh, as a process of trying to ultimately realign the Democratic Party towards climate justice, uh, and to work on a daily basis uh, for the next several years on, on making California as uh, clean, a clean energy economy as the world has ever known, and an example to uh, other states and regions. So uh, this, is a, um, this is a kind of a compressed uh, advanced seminar. Uh, do you want the lights on to take notes? All right, put a little light on there. Um, and I'll take you through it. Um, it. It helps keep me focused because we could go on and on and on. But I want to make three points in general tonight. One is that we, we are already in a transition to a clean energy economy in California. And sometimes when you're in a transition, whether it's evolutionary or revolutionary, <clears throat> you don't even notice that you're in the transition because it moves more rapidly than your consciousness. You're always adapting. So that's the first point, to understand that a process is underway that will make our lives uh, different uh, for a very long time. Second, next slide, the, the state can therefore be a model for national and global leverage. What happens in California doesn't stay in California, Governor Jerry Brown has said, and that is true. Um, and so what we do here locally almost naturally will have an impact on Oregon, on Washington, on Washington, D.C., on New York, on Illinois, and so on. Uh, and the third point I want to make is that uh, to accomplish this, uh, we will have to be um, very aware that we're in a delicate process of completely realigning the nature of the Democratic Party towards climate justice in the state and nationally. Now, we've had realignments before, uh, and they usually, <coughs> excuse me, they usually are very rough. We, we had the realignment, I don't need a light if you're, okay. <laughs> wow, that's debatable. Uh, but we've had realignments before that are always quite wrenching uh, over the issue of realigning the Democratic Party away from its compromise with Southern segregation. Anything. Thank you very much. All right. So there's no sound. The uh, the the wrenching realignment of the '60s over race is something that we've not fully absorbed. It is still affecting our ability to function as a country. Um, there have been other realignments, but I'm I'm proposing that it's a necessity that we experience it, nothing less, nothing less than a complete realignment of the Democratic Party. And that will have reverberations on the Republican Party that we can get to, or third parties uh, to be. So, uh, let's go through this. The first thing that I want you to drill into your mind is the figure 120. California is spending $120 billion already on a clean energy economy between yesterday and the end of Jerry Brown's second term. That's money in the bank. That's not money to be raised or gotten off trees. That's money that is now being spent. And it's important that you know this because no one does. Perhaps because no one has an interest in telling you how much money is being spent because they're afraid of 
that knowledge <laughs> getting out. I don't know. We're not, we're, we're not supposed to be the party of big spenders, but we are big spenders on the environment. For example, this is way more than the United Kingdom spends on all of its renewable and uh, wind energy and solar energy budget. That's the United Kingdom. So you can imagine where Saudi Arabia is or, or Alabama. $120 billion being spent, okay? Next slide. Uh, to take you through this in some detail, and I know uh, th this is uh, not elegant, you have to understand that California laws on the environment always lead the nation and always are catalytic converters to the nation's energy policy. It never goes the other way. So if we slow down, the nation slows down. If we speed up, the rest of the nation speeds up. Uh, for example, uh, the Clean Air Act started here. That's why we have uh, a California Energy Commission and a California uh, Clean Air Air Pollution Laws on the books. Uh, fuel efficiency standards started here. Green building efficient uh, building design started here. Venture capital for energy efficiency and green uh, uh, energy projects is at a level here uh, which makes the Silicon Valley the Wall Street of the environment. Uh, consumer energy savings over the past 40 years in your pocket instead of in the utilities pocket, at least $74 billion. Currently, there are 200,000 clean energy jobs in the state of California, and that's a minimum estimate, and that's way more than the uh, fossil, fuel fossil fuel industry has ever uh, employed. Our renewable energy generation, that is uh, from non-fossil fuel sources, most notably the sun or wind, uh, has increased 56% in the last decade. We now get three times more electricity from solar energy than we did 10 years before. Next. The wind generation in this state has increased five-fold in the past 10 years. 15.4% of our electricity in state is from renewables three times the U.S. as a whole. Silicon Valley Venture Capital has put in $27 billion since 2006. The per capita greenhouse gas emissions, this is one of those technical phrases you have to absorb if you want to be trendy, but you have to deabsorb it in order to talk to your neighbors. But it means greenhouse gas emissions, which are mainly carbon but also methane, et cetera, uh, have to be driven down if the planet is to be stabilized uh, uh, before it slips into unknowable and extremely dangerous conditions by 2050. Our per capita emissions have been pushed down 17% since 1990. Uh, and that's while the population of the state and the economy of the state has grown. And during a time in which we have phased out all but one nuclear plant and we're phasing out coal, not as rapidly as we should, but it's being phased out. But, so that's what I mean by a clean energy economy, one that is increasingly powered by conservation and renewables, is an advanced economy, a high-tech economy, uh, and does not rely on uh, nuclear power or coal. Uh, that is a definition. Now, the governor just gave his state of the state address and uh, he, he made uh, multiple points that were briefly referred to in the mainstream media. And by the way, we've achieved all this without any mainstream media being able to uh, cover it for us. Just, just occasionally there's a reference, but we're down to about three newspapers and no television coverage, and it doesn't seem to matter. We're still moving along like the little train that chugged forward. But what he just 
said is kind of uh, astonishing. Even if you think he should do more or you disagree with him on one issue or another, he said the new goal for from now, 15 years from now, to 2030. And by the way, these goals are very important because when they're set, there are penalties for not achieving them. This is, this is one area where scientific information and metrics are very important uh, because when you set a goal, that's a state action based on hopefully research and hearings and all that. And then you let the private sector and many institutions carry out the achievement of the goal as they wish, but they pay a price if they do not achieve the goal. That is how it is successful so far. So here we already get 33% um, of our uh, electricity, as I said, from, I'm sorry, we get 20% of our electricity now from renewables. The goal for 2020 is 33%. That's in five years. The goal for 2030 is 50%. So that's double or triple where we are now. And that's the, the new policy of the state to be discussed by the legislature. But it has the status of law. It's a mandatory goal. Secondly, he said we're going to cut petroleum use in the state by 50%. We're going to cut petroleum use in half by 2030. Think about that. One thing that means is the um, sales of electric cars are going to go up as rapidly as houses in the 1940s and 50s. I am going to announce here tonight that I am going to buy an electric car this month. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to prove that you can buy a car that generates no pollution and doesn't cost anything. I'm not going to buy an electric car that costs something because people go a little crazy at sticker shock or what will it cost and all that sort of stuff. I want to prove that there's nothing left to argue. Are you with me? Do you want a car that doesn't cost anything and doesn't pollute? What's the matter with that? So put me on television in an advertisement in one of those used car lots. Do something. We have to achieve. We, we already have uh, a, a goal of 1.5 million cars on the road by... Uh, 2025, I think it is. That's due to legislation supported by the governor and pushed by Environment California. That's not enough. We have 23 million cars on the road. That's crazy. So to get to this goal, just in the automobile sector, I'm figuring, and I base this on some you know, notes from the governor's office, we need to have 6 million cars powered entirely by electricity in the next 15 years to begin to make that kind of cut uh, in emissions. Uh, so that's why I'm doing it. Um, uh, I'm thinking about fiat. My son doesn't think it's big enough. My wife thinks I'll kill myself because it's fragile. They want me to buy a larger, uglier vehicle with a worse engine. I think I'm going for fiat, but that's up to you. No cost, no emissions, that's the ticket. Uh, we need to double the energy efficiency of buildings. I didn't even realize you could do that. But that's what our scientists and engineers and architects and designers say. We can squeeze out half the uh, energy we use in buildings currently. Uh, the, I think the attack there is on new buildings are like zero emission buildings, you know, like the electric car. And then you phase in uh, other buildings into your equation as they crumble and are replaced and so on. Um, he also mentioned, uh, but without going into detail, expanding rooftop solar. That should be done also at no expense. Uh, it can be done. Uh, we've got to really jump on the DWP because for some reason they're a little nervous about all of you generating power from your rooftop and not paying them. I, I see some heads nodding, yes. Um, 
We have to reduce uh, methane and black carbon emissions drastically. I'll get to that in a moment. And there's got to be a plan. It's going to be announced in 2015, 2016 for ex extreme measures to preserve our wetlands and our forests, not only for their own sake, but because they absorb carbon. That's going to be quite a task with the drought and forest fires. We'll get to that. Okay, next. Uh, 2030, just to reemphasize re this, according to the United Nations goals, we've got to get 80% reductions by 2050. To get anywhere near that, we've got to get a doubling of our rate of reductions in 15 years by 2030. That's a, that's a doubling of our current rate. Okay, next. That requires what I call the climate justice model which leaps ahead to the idea of realignment. But it's very simple. Next, please. Um, if you look at our state, this, of course, is the Los Angeles area. And the brown, red, rust color is particulate matter pollution, the invisible stuff, not just the stuff in the air that you can see. That's the most intense area of pollution in the state is that dark. That's also where most communities of color, working class communities, are concentrated in the state. If you look at it statewide, you see in the valley below Sacramento, down through uh, Bakersfield, Kern County, that's where the majority of farm workers live, working class Latinos, poor people, and that's where the heaviest pollution uh, tends to be. Uh, death dealing health affecting, asthma producing, life shortening pollution. So next please, no way to lower emissions except through greater justice. I'm way past the argument about uh, environment versus jobs. I th that argument is dead as far as I'm concerned in California. But there's a big question about uh, whether people understand that the only way to now lower carbon and methane emissions is by increasing environmental protection in urban areas, rural areas, areas of high poverty and working class concentration where, for example, to take the simplest example, most of the freeways go, most of the diesel trucks go, most of the, the traffic congestion is. Uh, and we can do that through this magic formula that has been translated into law over the past 10 years, what I, I call the 32435 solution, trying to sound like Einstein. Um, AB 32 is our carbon reduction program. It's really greenhouse gases. Carbon is the most prominent. But it was passed with democratic votes and the signature of Arnold Schwarzenegger in 2006. It was a compromise between different points of view. But what it requires is the um, lowering of our, of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's called a cap. And it allows a company like Chevron or whomever to meet their cap, their lower emission permit, by either reducing pollution or investing in something that protects the environment and lowers pollution in exchange for which they get to continue polluting. It's kind of crazy, but that's politics. For example, Chevron can pollute the Bay Area because it has a permit by which they obtained 100,000 acres of woods in my native state of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So that's what cap and trade is. Over time, it forces down pollution overall while letting polluters make short-term adjustments. They can buy their way out of their obligations in Richmond, California by purchasing a forest somewhere else. A lot of people have real problems with this. I don't know if I would have voted for it. But it now has helped reduce our emissions since 2006. Um, 
and it has generated billions of dollars. Currently, there's two or three billion being spent. This coming year, it might go up to four or five, and that money is being spent directly. It's going out the door. It'll be debated by the legislature, but it has to fall within certain criteria, which takes us to 535, the other half of the equation. 535, passed by Senator De Leon, signed last year after a five-year debate, says any cap-and-trade program, any AB32 program, any program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions must include co-benefits for disadvantaged communities. That's a way to capture the windfall or capture the money from cap and trade and make sure that it's reinvested in areas that have the hardest time economically, have the greatest uh, levels of uh, uh, serious health problems, uh, birth defects, lack of hospitals, that sort of thing. So that's a, we now have a requirement, and there really has not been a big controversy about it, to go ahead and reduce pollution by increasing the well-being of people in inner cities, communities of color, people that live alongside freeways, people in poor areas. I know you don't know this is happening because there is no way to find out. There is nothing about it in the newspapers. You only have my word. I'm like the guy that's come from another continent to tell you what I've discovered over there. So remember it well because you'll never read about it. And it's extremely important, don't you think? Okay, <laughs> next. Uh, th now, there are some challenges here um, that uh, have not been settled. One is, you've heard about divestment. You know, divestment from Israel, divestment from tobacco, divestment from um, um, South African apartheid. I've been through it all. Uh, I know a lot about divestment politics. And what I know is that Divestment, when it arises, is like a signal of things to come. And so we're at the very early stage of trying to divest from fossil fuels. That is, the, if you're a state employee, your pensions are supposed to be invested securely. If you're a University of, of, of uh, California professor, likewise, the state pension funds are in the many tens of billions of dollars. Uh, and they're it, it kind of in the hands of the 1%, but they serve the needs of the middle class. Uh, and there's, there are always attempts to manipulate them. Uh, what's coming is a realization that investment in fossil fuels is a risky investment because they could be stranded assets in technical terms. That means Someday, if it becomes more difficult or impossible to extract all the coal or gas or oil from the ground for all kinds of reasons, including environmental regulations, those assets that you've invested your money in become stranded. That is, they don't pay uh, a, a return. And so the argument for what is a safe investment is shifting ground, is changing every day to a realization that it's unsafe to invest taxpayer money or investor money in highly risky deposits of shale, natural gas, oil, nuclear, for all kinds of reasons, especially if there's other industries that are cleaner or 100% clean where the money can be invested safely. So instead of divesting from fossil fuels, we're beginning to have a conversation about reinvesting in the new energy economy and getting the investments out of the old economy. For example, the students at the University of California have been waging a campaign about divestment from fossil fuels for the past year or two, thinking that they're getting nowhere. But they actually got a kind of interesting compromise from the uh, regents of the university who were kind of uh, dinosaurs on this question. 
You know, I know at the just before the extinction of the dinosaurs, they were probably having a cocktail party at UC, and then they weren't there anymore. Uh, so the, what the students got was a UC investment committee said, no, 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 we can't divest from fossil fuels. But they said, we'll give you $1 billion to invest in clean energy over the, last, over the next five years. I thought that was pretty good for rookie students just starting their civil disobedience careers is good. <laughs> they thought, oh, no, it's terrible. It doesn't go far enough. I said, look, these things take a long time before they go very rapidly. But they got a billion dollars, which at least proves it is possible to shift investments totally away from fossil fuels uh, without losing a beat. And I think that will be the trend. Kevin DeLeon, the Senate uh, pro tem, has introduced a bill modeled on what Stanford did last year, which was divest from coal. Uh, he wants to divest all the state's pension funds, funds from coal. Being the leader of the Senate, he's got a fighting chance to get that through the legislature. I'm working with his office and the students to try to expand it to include a phased withdrawal from fossil fuel investments over a longer time frame than one year. He wants out of coal more or less immediately. We'll see how that goes. You know, it's tough to navigate the process, but that's one that you should really be paying close attention to because it's on the horizon. The stuff I've told you about so far is already happening. It's for you to direct it to the best outcomes. This is beginning to happen. This is Ann Stossiball with some of the students. She is the head of CalPERS, the State Public Employees Research uh, uh, What's the S? Retirement? Retirement what? System, right. Uh, and the, uh, the, the thing about her is I remember when she was a UC student activist herself at Davis. So I know what's in her heart. I know what's in her background. She says, oh, no, we can never invest. But she'll give you all kinds of advice about how to go about it if it's gradual and responsible. So I, if I were a fossil fuel dinosaur, I would not trust these people to, to stand to the end in, in defense of the dinosaurs. So the students there are working on her and talking to her, and she's very open, and it's, it's a fight. It's an argument, and the unions have to get into it. The state legislature has to get into it. Democratic clubs have to get into it. But it, it will happen. Too slow for all of us, probably, but uh, much too rapidly for the dinosaurs. Next. Uh, on fracking, I know there's been a lot of activists in the Democratic Party who are up in a, uh, anger uh, towards the governor about fracking. So let me put this on the list of the to-do items. Um, I, I am opposed to fracking. It makes no sense to me for all kinds of reasons, but uh, I'm sort of an extremist. Um, what I'm trying to understand is how we deal with fracking without um, so antagonizing each other that we weaken our unity and weaken our ranks. Um, <coughs> it, it may be that showing up to the governor's office and pronouncing him finished in history unless he declares a moratorium on fracking will someday yield a result. I don't know. All I know is that so far uh, nothing has happened except the governor has built up a big regulatory wall that makes fracking harder. Uh, and I know that uh, the uh, energy economy currently is problematic for the fracking industry. But what I do know is that the protest should continue because history shows that a cause can be delayed but never denied. And also, in the meantime, there's a lot of fracking issues right around us. The city council here in Culver uh, signed a deal that allows fracking right in your neighborhood, right here on this spot. Um, and that uh, contract is rolling over, and the city council, I believe, is in the process of re-examining what they should allow or disallow with respect to fracking in Culver City. Down the road uh, on West Adams Historic District, that's a picture I took, 
that's uh, between a house and a church uh, in, a, in a neighborhood of old homes that are highly precious, treasured in Los Angeles. They're, they're trying to frack there. The community got up in a total uproar, caused a moratorium to pass the LA City Council. The moratorium said that the city attorney, Mike Fuhr, should send back language imposing a moratorium in Los Angeles. That was 10 months ago, and Mike has never sent the language back. I think, I don't know, because of a fear that the industry is so powerful they'll sue the city and try to bankrupt the city, which is, that's a threat. We're used to threats. Um, it's not like a nuclear threat. Uh, it's just a threat. But the response to the, a threat should not be for the city attorney of Los Angeles to, to stop in his tracks and not deliver the language required by an ordinance. There, that's something uh, uh, to talk about. Karen Bass knows about that. She's your congressperson. Uh, uh, Mike Fuhr, you, most of you know as Democrats, uh, you can be asking him, where's the language? And then look at it very carefully. What are the loopholes you put in the language, if any, and so on. But you could impose a moratorium uh, permanently if the language came back to the council, was voted on, and signed by Mayor Garcetti. Uh, next. This is Joanne Kim. You should know her. She's the executive director of the um, Community Coalition uh, just down the road in South Central near UC. She's at the fracking site. She's a brilliant organizer. It shows that a lot of community-led movements are very successful, but when you're up against a big industry, you need a broad coalition, and more people need to join with the uh, community coalition to achieve that citywide goal of a moratorium. Next. Uh, uh, another side issue that's important to confront, I think everybody should read uh, Naomi Klein's book. It's a very important book. Uh, I don't know if it changes everything. It's a little apocalyptic. Uh, to me, but it's like a wide-eyed discovery of how serious the crisis is by somebody who 10 years ago didn't think it was that serious. But she's like all of us. She's every person um, in that sense. But next, please. One of the things she says that I think is um, a, 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 an oversight because she doesn't write about California, the epicenter of the movement. She doesn't write about it. But in general terms, she comes very close to saying that capitalism has to go first before the climate crisis can be solved. This is a little like the socialists in 1917 telling the suffragettes that we have to achieve socialism first and then you get the right to vote. It's one of those untasteful arguments that you don't really want to get caught up in because you get bruises for a lifetime. I'm not even getting over that 1917 argument, and I'm the one who was there. The same thing will happen to us. Here's the point. We do have billionaires like Tom Steyer in this state and in Silicon Valley who um, usually are Republicans on most issues. He's not. Uh, but on climate, they've made a judgment that the climate crisis is so serious that it could destroy the capitalist system that they value so highly. And so they're investing in clean energy in order to stave off a greater disaster to their system. Should we say no to that because we don't like their motives? Would you like your motives examined every time you chose to take sides on an issue? I don't think so. So I think if it, the way it's going to go is, is more like the New Deal, that there were some big businessmen who thought the system was in danger of collapsing and going communist. So they invested in fundamental reforms. They helped Roosevelt. That's how we got Social Security. That's how we got the uh, unions, collective bargaining. And this is how this will go. One group of people like the Koch brothers will want to destroy the system 
if, if they have to, to, to avoid changing it. And another group, like Tom Steyer, want to save their system by making it more equitable and more stable and more sustainable for others. So you have these complicated problems. And these are not abstract. If Steyer runs for the US Senate against Kamala Harris, I will support Kamala Harris because I'm a Democrat. I hope she does well on climate. But in that kind of Democratic primary, which she probably would win, it will deepen our divisions, women, people of color, et cetera, on one side, labor, and on the other side, big green organizations who are funded by Steyer, plus Steyer, plus some Silicon Valley people. Uh, it's not what we need at this time because he does very well for the environment by giving 50 or 100, billion, 100 million dollars every year to candidates. So. It, it, some of this is managing the insoluble, learning to think through contradictions that you can't resolve in the short run. It, it's a problem to be managed and navigated, not solved by eliminating one side of the equation or another. So I'm for the green billionaires as long as they're green, and I don't mean money. Uh, next. California's diplomacy, um, you, you may be thinking, this is, a, this is a global crisis. How can California solve it? It's kind of like, I'm only an individual. How can I solve something in California? Well, th there is no solution uh, uh, in one state. However, we're all aware that some cities like Los Angeles or San Francisco tend to pull California forward. And other cities like Bakersfield tend to pull California backward. It's the same in the country or the world. So it, California is a leverage point. But California has to use its leverage. California Democrats have got to work with Democrats in other states using California as a model, and I'll tell you exactly why, to pull the country up. And we've already begun. Next, please. Um, Obama's very helpful because these two guys represent 40% of the emissions on the carbon emissions on the planet. And without them agreeing to a conceptual treaty of some kind to reduce emissions, slower, less than we need, but once that starts to move, it tends to gain ground. That's important. But Obama, as you may have noticed, doesn't have a, a Congress and maybe not even a Supreme Court to work with. So out of necessity, we're back to old-fashioned federalism, which was defined by Brandeis as the laboratory of the states. In other words, Obama needs Jerry Brown. Next. Uh, we already have a pact between <coughs> California, Oregon, Washington State, and British Columbia. Uh, those three Pacific Coast states have 77 electoral votes. Uh, that's what we would call a low carbon to no carbon agreement, energy agreement among those three states. Next. In the Great Lakes, we have an another 71 electoral votes uh, in, in, in um, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, with Manitoba connected as well, and with several observers. Next. In the East Coast, New England, New York, it's very interesting. You have a greenhouse gas initiative that has Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Jersey was out, and now that their governor is running for president, New Jersey's back in shows that you can generate some pull on, on uh, somebody like a Christie. Um, and they have observers in uh, Pennsylvania, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Quebec. It's 114 electoral votes. California also has a pact, uh, a, a common market with uh, Quebec in uh, the cap and trade system. Uh, next, please. Now, what's left out here, but you can visualize this, California has um, 
low energy, no energy agreements with three states in China alone whose population is larger than the United States. California has a pact with um, Germany, uh, which is the only country slightly farther ahead than California. California has similar pacts with 10 or 15 other countries. And they're assembling a coalition that I call a clean energy coalition to press their argument at the, at the international talks this December uh, in Paris, where an agreement will be reached or not reached. If it's reached, that will be historic. It will be small compared to what we have to do, but the alternative would, to, would be to reach no agreement and the world would fall into complete energy chaos. So California can play a pivotal role, and you can play a pivotal role right here in your chair if you influence California, California influences the country, the country influences the UN talks, the UN talks result in an agreement. You may not know this, but most of the energy activists and environmentalists on planet Earth look to California for leadership and look to Jerry Brown. There's only one person more important than Jerry Brown in the world, Pope Francis, in their view who has just declared that all creation is holy and it, it's a sin to desecrate it and pollution falls most heavily on the poor. So Francis is on board with AB 32, 435. Apparently he's read the, he's read the, the talking points, but I can see the, um, if the Cuba talks were, were monitored by the Pope, why not the global climate talks? I think that's gonna happen this December. So now, the final point, uh, or close to the final point, why the Democrats have to become a party of climate justice. Next, please. Um, our majority in California would be environmentalists plus environmental justice plus health care plus labor plus green entrepreneurs versus fossil fuel polluters, climate deniers, and the Republican Party with its big money. That's about a 55-45 division. Uh, that's a majority for sure. Next, um, uh, here's an example. Uh, our representative, Julia Brownlee, who's good, but could do much more on climate, uh, and uh, the new assembly person up in Ventura, uh, Jackie Irwin, they won by like 1%. In th that was the only swing election in California. Otherwise, California is permanently on the progressive column. That election saw millions of dollars of Republican money poured into trying to defeat Brownlee and take back that assembly district for the Republicans, and they failed. They, they failed because of the Democrats turned out. They failed because the women were on the road and knocking on the doors. They failed because the unions, they, they failed to defeat the unions, the traditional Democratic party coalition led by women in this case, but they also failed because of Oxnard. In Oxnard, day after day, night after night, farm workers and other environmental justice activists knocked on Latino doors, led by Carmen Ramirez, who is the mayor pro tem and a real hero of the climate justice movement in California who's little known. In an election like that, the turnout in Oxnard won the election for the Democrats. And so Democrats, therefore, have an obligation to Oxnard. We want to protect our coast, all well and good. But you know what? The coast in Oxnard has more power plants than the whole coastline from here to San Francisco. Because it's a poor area, it's a working class area, it's a Latino area, it's exactly the location of pollution and poverty converging to create suffering that I was describing about at the beginning. That's a working definition by example of how only this combination can move us forward. Next, please. In your area, we have new Senator Ben Allen, uh, very good, needs to be uh, urged to take this on as a number one priority because he has so many priorities. Fran Pavley is in her last two years. I uh, don't know who she'll be replaced by, but 
She is the author of AB 32, which came out of our general uh, Southern California coastal communities. Richard Bloom, who's a pro-business Democrat in Santa Monica, happens on this issue to be extremely good and is the chair of the budget subcommittee that decides how to spend the cap and trade money. He deserves a visit, whatever you think of positions on other issues. Senator Holly Mitchell, African-American senator, who's leading the fight against fracking in the Senate and has 16 Democratic votes and needs 21. All right, next. The conservatives, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm defining them as conservative because they refuse to vote against fracking or they refuse to vote at all. But it's a pretty good indicator of where we are. Luke Correa is out. Um, Kathleen Galgiani in Stockton, still there. Ed Hernandez in the urban South uh, uh, Los Angeles suburbs. Norma Torres uh, went to Congress next. They were no votes. Not voting. Ron Calderon from LA, now in prison. Ben Hueso, San Diego, still there. Ricardo Lara, don't put him down one way or another. He's a very good person. He happens to be the chair of the Latino Caucus, which means he has to elect Democrats and elect Latinos. And so he winds up kind of managing the contradictions of the Latino Caucus. But in his heart and in his head, he's a solid, uh, solid vote for climate uh, 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 change legislation. Richard Roth, L Riverside. Michael Rubio kind of exemplifies the whole thing. I never heard of this when I was in the Senate. He got elected to the Senate, which is one of the greatest jobs in the world, and he immediately was hired by Chevron to be their lobbyist in the Senate. So, so that kind of gives it to you in a synopsis of what we are up against. Uh, next. So I want to say, in general, we've come a very, very long way in perspective here. I'm a very old man standing here with a very old man. That's the beginning of the solar industry. You see the little, the little propeller down there. Remember when we used to give those out to kids? I was the chair of the, governor, of the governor's solar energy council at the time. Next. <laughs> and this is 2013. He wrote to me, many miles to go. To, to go. That's true, many miles to go, but I want to remind you how far we've come. Uh, this is Byron Scher a month ago. He was my colleague, the chairman of Natural Resources, and he was the architect of all the state's good climate legislation, the architect of the uh, uh, Energy Commission, the architect that laid the foundations for all of this. He is now... Um, 87 years old and going strong, living in the Sacramento area and still very much uh, in the battle. Finally, uh, to remind you of the stakes, when he began his first term the second time around, the governor sent an email to some friends asking what should be done about these charts that he was looking at from the CIA. One, drought. Two, Fire, three, flood, four, war, armed conflicts that have to do with resource bloodshed. Uh, so those are the stakes. And there's some hope if you think about this uh, in this state where the industry was created. Uh, just this year, the Europeans sent a, um, a spacecraft on a multi-year journey, uh, trillions of miles, to hook up with a comet called Rosetta to explore the ingredients of what may be evidence of the beginnings of the universe. It's very interesting. The Rosetta made its successful mission and is in, in helping discover these secrets because it was powered by solar panels that made up a 48-foot wingspan that lasted trillions of miles 
and dozens of years. Which is to say, it's not a technical problem. It's not a scientific problem. It's a moral, cultural, economic, and political problem.